Okay, you're good to go, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Good evening, members of the public. Welcome staff and council to this uh, November 15th regular council meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Moved by Martin Lang, second by Stephanie Jaworski. Be it resolved that the November 15th regular council meeting of the Township of South Glengarry be called to be, uh, now be opened at 7 p.m. All those in favor of the motion? Motion is carried, thank you very much. I'll now ask everyone to stand for the playing of our national anthem. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we have uh, two items that have been requested to be moved from information only into other business, those being item 7DH, the information report uh, regarding uh, users for Kennedy Redwood, as well as item 70I, which is the information report regarding uh, the Enbridge uh, grant for um, smoke detectors, I believe it is. Okay. Seeing no other amendments or deletions, moved by Stephanie Jaworski, second by Sam McDonnell. Be it resolved that the Council of the Township of South Glengarry approved the agenda as amended. All those in favor? Of the motion. Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, just uh, the, the Enbridge uh, one was G instead of, uh, there's two Enbridge reports tonight. It's the one G one instead of I, that's all. Oh, My apologies. Okay. Thank you for noting that. Okay, moving on to item number four, declaration of pecuniary interest. <clears throat> uh, seeing none. I'll go to approval of the minutes. Moved by Sam McDonnell, second, second by Martin Lang. Be it resolved that the minutes of the November 1st regular council meeting, including the closed session minutes, be adopted as circulated. All those in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. And 5B. Moved by Martin Lang, second by Stephanie Jaworski. Be it resolved that the minutes of the November 5th special council meeting, including the closed session minutes, be adopted as circulated. All those in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Thank you. Now moving on to item six, presentations and delegations. I understand we have uh, Watersheds Canada AOC project, Barbara King. Who is introducing uh, Ms. King? Ms. Clerk, is she just going to start or is there a staff member introducing the presenter? Um, I don't believe we have a, a formal introduction. I believe Ms. King is going to just give the uh, presentation. 
<laughs> okay, well, welcome, Ms. King, and uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. So I appreciate your time. Uh, I have a quick presentation uh, just to share a new project that's coming to the area. Uh, so we did receive funds uh, in partnership with a, a number of local organizations to bring a shoreline naturalization program. So I'm just going to do about a 10 to 12 minute presentation and you can ask some questions at the end of it. So just give me one moment. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so everybody sees that? Yes. Great. So I'm Barbara King, Executive Director of Watersheds Canada. And uh, we're actually a fairly small organization that's been working in Eastern Ontario for many years. So our main focus is, is the protection, restoration of lakes and rivers across Canada. So we do run our programs here in Eastern Ontario, and then we package our programs and share them with others. So we're actually working in other provinces as well. Um, so we started working uh, with a number of groups uh, back last January, and we put in an application uh, for funding um, and did receive money under uh, the Remedial Action Plan. Um, so we have a three-year project. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of context around kind of why we do the work that we do. Um, so what we do on our land has, you know, a direct link to what's happening kind of on our freshwater ecosystems. Um, so many people don't realize that when we're talking about shoreline properties, um, you know, that we need to keep about 75% of our shorelines natural for, for fish and wildlife. Um, so 90% of aquatic life needs to use a natural shoreline at some point in its life cycle. And 70% of land-based mammals need to have a natural shoreline at some point um, to survive. So this is just an interesting video and I hope it works for you guys. Um, just to show you kind of what things look like on a healthy ecosystem. Can you see that? Um, no, I think we're just seeing your, like the PowerPoint slide sort of view. <clears throat> we're not viewing the presentation in presentation mode. Okay, so let's see how I do that because I see it in presentation mode. Let me, I have a second screen and that could be why. So I'm just going to unplug my second screen. Did that help? Still at the same screen as when you started. There oh, we now go. It's good. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Uh, let's try that again. Do you see it as a full screen now? Uh, nothing there <coughs> we do, yes. Yes? Okay. Great. Sorry about that. And thank you for uh, letting me know. I think it was my second screen. So, I'm just gonna play this video and hopefully you can see that. Um, just to kind of have a look at what's happening underwater. So you can see, you know, this is a fully natural shoreline. You see an abundance of aquatic vegetation, lots of fish, clear water. And, uh, you know, there's also a habitat you know, where there's a depth free and that becomes critical fish habitat. So, you know, we're talking about the aquatic life needing to have, you know, a really kind of healthy shoreline. You know, this is what we're talking about. Oops. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide, which is a contrast. And we took these videos up on, a, on um, in an area that was quite developed versus a very natural area. And uh, you see a big difference. Oh, this one. Is it working for you? I think is this a of, video? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's always tricky with online. So anyways, you may not see the full video, um, but what you're looking at is kind of a really, you know, the difference is you don't have that same underwater community of vegetation. You know, a lot of the shoreline has been cleared. You have the cloudy water. Um, you know, in terms of uh, habitat for fish and wildlife. So it's just kind of showing a visual and I apologize that the visual didn't work. Um, so I can always send that along, but it's interesting kind of when you see visually above and below water. So we've been going out 
been carrying out shoreline assessments now um, for a number of years. And what we're finding is we've carried out about 40,000 shoreline assessments. And our data shows us that you know, only 22% of properties that we're um, seeing have at least that 75% natural shoreline. Um, so when you're kind of looking at, you know, um, taking care of the very waters, you know, that, you know, sustains us and, and the wildlife, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in that area. So we're finding a lot of properties like this on the left, um, where we have, you know, large developments, you know, clearing all the vegetation down to, to the waterfront. And it's impacting, you know, the health of our lakes and rivers. So the program that we put in funding um, with local partners is to engage with 50 waterfront property owners, um, kind of looking around Lake St. Francis to plant 12,500 native uh, plants uh, along the riparian area. Um, over the next three years. And also to build capacity with some of the local partners so that they can continue the program into the future. Oh dear. Okay. <clears throat> you can see that okay still? Yeah. Um, so some of the activities we're gonna be carrying out uh, communications uh, engagement through media, uh, press releases, press um, presentations, um, you know, and, and reaching people, hopefully through various networks, and then working uh, to host a number of workshops as well. So we'll be starting those in the spring and um, carrying out the uh, shoreline assessments um, as well. So these are the project partners, um, which we're really excited to, to work with. And um, we've just hired an intern um, who's gonna be working for uh, MCA and uh, she'll be helping to kind of coordinate in the local area. So a little bit about how it works. So the Natural Edge program, um, we actually go out and carry out site visits with individual property owners using a tablet. So we have a app that we created, you know, that builds in a native plant database um, where we can create the planting plan with people in real time. Uh, on their property. So it's based on the preferences of the landowner. So obviously they wanna keep an area open for swimming, uh, access to the water and, you know, and it's kind of like talking through of, you know, areas that they're not currently using could potentially be restored uh, back to a natural state. So we work with landowners and then go out and actually restore the shoreline. Um, so this is just an example of what one of the planting plans would look like um, using the program. So, you know, this would be working with the landowner, say they're, you know, interested in having really low uh, shrubs because they care about their view. They might want to bring in some color, some of the wildflowers, and they can scroll through uh, with us, you know, look at the different native plants that might be appropriate for their property. And kind of like a menu, you know, picking what they want, where they want them, and then they get a planting plan, um, you know, for their property. So it's kind of like a natural landscaping plan. Um, so it's not quite the same as bringing in a landscaper because we're not dealing with, um, you know, the aesthetics of retaining walls and things like that. It's, it's more, you know, using plants uh, to bring their shoreline back to a natural state. This is just a couple of photos of some of our before and after. Um, so this was a site on a river um, that was experiencing a lot of erosion, uh, you know, and the property owners were, were losing, you know, significant chunks of land and kind of looking into what they could do to, to stabilize their shoreline and also bring wildlife back to their property. And uh, it's come along really nicely and the landowners just love it because it's beautiful and it's natural and they've kept sections open where they, you know, access the water. Um, this is another property owner who uh, was, you know, all in. His daughter uh, went to school and, and was learning about, you know, kind of the environment and, and uh, you know, said, hey, dad, we need to make changes. And uh, so he restored his land. He wanted only potted stock. So this is the, the plants that we brought to his property. And, uh, you know, it's really natural. He, he wanted things tall and wild. And, you know, this is kind of his seating area down by the water now. 
And the interesting story with him is that, you know, he talks about how his neighbors who thought he was crazy uh, because, you know, it, it wasn't the normal thing to do. Everybody had grass to the water's edge. And, uh, you know, now this is uh, about five years later, his neighbor's grandchildren come to his house to play because he has all the frogs and the butterflies and the really cool stuff. You know, he's getting a little bit of some aquatic plants back in the water. And, you know, his neighbor who thought he was crazy is now saying, huh, you know, maybe I should look into that because um, the kind of the, you know, the, the different wildlife that's come back. And another uh, common um, project is, you know, people bring in riprap. And I think that's fairly common is just, you know, bigger water, bigger riprap. <laughs> um, but you can actually do some planting within the rocks. So this property owner, um, you know, need dealt with some erosion control with riprap. And I know there's a lot of riprap, um, you know, up in, in their area. And you can actually go in and plant between the stones and uh, work with contractors when the riprap's being put in uh, with the goal that eventually you don't see that riprap um, and you get vegetation growing in. So just because you have riprap doesn't mean you can't have um, some natural vegetation. You can bring in mature trees because the roots are gonna go down and, and hold that in place. And then as the leaf litter, drops and fills in the voids, you know, eventually you're not going to see that rock. So this is a, about a three to four years later, um, where things are really starting to fill in from the planting that we did amongst the stones. Um, so I'll leave it at that, just kind of short and sweet. But, um, you know, what we're looking for from you is to help us uh, promote the project. And um, hopefully that, you know, as you have landowners that are, would be interested, we could have information, brochures, maybe, you know, um, other opportunities to collaborate. We have worked with people in, in townships. We work with TD, Friends of the Environment, and have done a whole lot of demonstration sites with various municipalities. And, you know, where you might put some interpretive signs and you may naturalize, you know, one of your properties to kind of show people what they can do. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. King, for your presentation. Are there any uh, questions of Council? Mm -hmm. Councillor Jaworski. Thank you, through Deputy Mayor Warden. Uh, I think in retrospect, perhaps I should have introduced Ms. King because um, I actually had the pleasure of seeing this presentation once already. Uh, Ms. King presented to the St. Lawrence River Restoration Council. Yes. Uh, maybe two months ago or a month ago, uh, ago, yeah. and where I'm the South Glengarry representative. And when I saw the presentation, you know, I thought that this would be particularly interesting in South Glengarry because, you know, our whole southern border is waterfront. And um, as you heard from Ms. King, you know, they are looking for landowners to participate. I'm fairly confident uh, that we would have landowners who'd want to participate. And also we as the township, we also own waterfront land so uh, you know this might be something that we would want to participate in as well um i thought one thing that i thought was really interesting is it is unfortunate the video didn't work as well as it could but just that visual of what that naturalized uh, shoreline is like underwater in terms of uh, the condition of the water and, uh, and the ha and the the life that's below it and i think you know it, that's a bit of a paradigm shift. I think there's sort of this element that if things mm -hmm. are are neat and tidy, that that is means that they are they are well and good. And the analogy I, I often think of is, you know, it's that red delicious apple. It looks beautiful and red on the outside, but then when you bite into it, it's kind of so sugary that it's kind of gone mushy on the inside. So I mm -hmm. think, you know, like it was interesting to see this sort of, par you know, paradigm shift of what things can look like on the outside to have vitality on the inside. Um, and again, you know, like most of our waterfront is privately owned. So really we need to rely on landowners to uh, look at projects like this. And I think that if more landowners were more aware of the, these kind of projects and also be, you know, learn more about, about these issues, I think a lot of them would be very interested in doing these things uh, on, of their own accord. So I, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that this is something that we can uh, participate in with Watersheds Canada. Thank you very much. Uh, I concur with what Councillor uh, Jaworski said. Um, uh, I think this is, uh, at the very least, we could help you promote this mm -hmm. in our area. And I certainly would have no uh, no reason why we couldn't explore potentially doing something on some of our own lands 
to show that we are good stewards as well, or at least trying to be. So thank you very much for your presentation and we will move on to the other items of the evening. Thanks again. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. Take care. So moving on to staff report 156-2021, Ms. Compo. Thank you and through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, Council, you may recall at our uh, last meeting on November 1st, um, you received a, a report and a presentation uh, regarding voting methods for the 2022 municipal election. Um, at that time, Council had directed um, administration to move forward with planning for uh, internet and telephone voting for the 2022 election. So that uh, approval must be done through a bylaw and that's what's before you this evening. So this bylaw is to authorize the alternative voting methods of internet and telephone voting. Thank you. I see no other hands up. Moved by Sam McDonnell, second by Martin Lang. Be it resolved that staff report 156-2021 be received and that bylaw 95-2021 being a bylaw to authorize alternative voting methods for the 2022 municipal election, be read a first, second, and third time, passed, signed, and sealed in open council this 15th day of November. All those in favor of the motion? Motion is carried, thank you very much. Moving on to staff report 157-2021, Ms. Compo. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, so before you this evening is the proposed schedule of council meetings for uh, 2022. You may recall this is uh, something that we do on an annual basis pursuant to our procedural bylaw. So the proposed uh, schedule follows um, what's outlined in our bylaw and, and what is typical um, of our schedule. So. That would be uh, regular meetings on the first and third um, Monday of each month, with the exception of uh, January and August. Um, and we also have the proposed dates for the 2022 budget meeting meetings included in the schedule, and those would be for the first and last Fridays of November. So subject to any questions or comments, that is my report this evening. Okay, thank you very much. I like that we're including the budget meetings. Uh, so it gives, uh, well, it gives us time to plan and well, they'll be in stone for the next council, whether we're here or not. So uh, one, uh, oh, sorry, uh, before you proceed, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, one other comment that I just wanted to uh, touch on one meeting that is not included in the schedule. Um, would be the inaugural meeting uh, with next year being an election uh, year. However, um, last year we we waited it out, or not last year, last election year, we waited it out to see when the other municipalities were holding their inaugural meetings so we could try and schedule around that should anyone wish to attend um, the meetings of other municipalities. So uh, at some point next year we'll We'll need to schedule that, but for now I've left it off the schedule until we get a little closer. Yeah, no worries. I, I believe there was talk, uh, there's some people saying that there doesn't necessarily need to be that much gap between election and inauguration. So uh, who knows if the province will change something along those lines between now and then. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and through you. Um, Ms. Campo, is it available? Could you send something out so that populates our calendar for the total year instead of uh, just doing it, you know, as we come, so, so they're all in there for us? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I like that idea. Councillor Jorsky. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor Warden. You brought up a, a, an interesting point I hadn't actually thought of, to be honest. Uh, with respect to the next council, Will our budget meetings not be before these ones that are being proposed, fourth and eighteenth? That's before the next council is being um, installed. Would it not be, or is, or, or were you saying that we would have like there'd be there is discretion? Because I think we were only installed like December sixth or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, well, how does that work? 
Yeah, that's a that's a fair comment, uh, Councillor Jaworski, because the dates that are proposed um, would uh, would occur before the new council is uh, is appointed and and takes office. So, um, and we would yeah. That's a good could uh, just uh, here's a comment uh, if that could be subject to council having return like three of the five returning uh, you could say that or I mean the thing about it is too is in four years at the end of the next term that council you know will do the budget so I don't know. We, uh, what, what I might propose is we, we approve the schedule as presented this evening. And I think once we get a little closer and closer in the election does take place, we have a better idea of what the composition um, of council will be at that point. If we do need to reschedule, that's always an option. Um, the budget meeting dates aren't in anything um, like our recycling calendar or anything like that, that's already been published. So we do have the option to reschedule if, if it's going to work out better, uh, given the results of the election. Yeah, thank you. Uh, final comment to Councillor Jorsky. No, thank, thank you. Uh, no, I, 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 thought, I think that's very reasonable to go ahead with that as they are presented. And as you say, when we get closer to that time, uh, we can adjust as necessary, because certainly if it's you know, these are these are good dates for staff to work towards. So if it is possible, these are good dates to have. But if the composition of council changes significantly, then that we can be looked at later. Thank you. I also feel like uh, since these budgets have been done earlier, I feel like it just we're we're started stepping off into the new year on the right foot, and we're done, and we're just waiting for the final numbers from the province. And I, I like the idea that staff need to have their budgets in before this time so that, and it just goes, it just gets easier. So thank you very much for the discussion. Moving on, uh, moved by Martin Lang, second by Stephanie Jaworski, be it resolved that staff report 157-2021 be received and that council of the township of South Mingary approves the recommended 2022 council meeting schedule. All those in favor of the motion. Councillor Jaworski has frozen, but I will vote in favor and it's carried. Thank you. Oh, there you are. Councillor Jaworski, I assume you had your hand up in the favor of that motion. I did. I'm sorry. I had someone who decided they wanted to get on Netflix and it shut me down for a moment. I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> The joys of rural living in South Glengarry. Uh, moving on to staff report 158-2021, Ms. Haley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. The purpose of the staff report this evening is to request council to consider an extension to the interim control bylaw that we put in place on November 16th, 2020. And the purpose of the interim control bylaw was to basically put a temporary freeze on a use of land to establish um, any new cannabis uh, cultivation facilities. Uh, one of the reasons why we put this in place in 2020 was we had um, an issue in our community where unfortunately we had uh, a location where the operator of the location did not conform to the bylaws and didn't realize that they had to check with the municipality first to determine if their use was permitted. And that cost us uh, quite a bit of time to be able to address. Luckily, it came into compliance, but it made us realize that since marijuana has um, become legal in 2018, um, we need to get our bylaws up to date to be able to accommodate these types of uses in areas that don't negatively impact the abutting property owners, where there's sufficient uh, separation distances and sufficient space for the operators to be able to um, utilize these facilities properly without receiving complaints as well. Um, when you put an interim control bylaw in place, you're required to do a study. And that study then is supposed to reveal uh, where the appropriate or applicable places are for uh, this type of use. And um, once the study is in place, we then uh, repeal this bylaw. You can only do one one-year extension and um, if you were to require um, an additional bylaw 
for this type of use, you would not be able to do that for at least three years. So it forces us to get, um, get our documents in order. Also, we have been working or watching our neighboring municipalities. In North Dundas, they put an interim control bylaw in place for this uh, type of use as well, right around the same time we did, and more recently, South Dundas. And that's because other municipalities were experiencing some operators that weren't completely in compliance. It's not that we don't want these operators, it's that we want these operators in the right location, that we don't end up getting complaints from our uh, residents who were there first. So um, I do hope that council considers passing this bylaw this evening as it'll give us adequate time. And it is anticipated that the application or the uh, bylaw will be repealed prior to um, 15th of November, 2022. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Haley, I've, has the county planner been uh, brought up to speed on this file? I know that uh, he wasn't in place prior to this uh, bylaw being passed originally. And I'm just wondering if the county has uh, a position in, in this regard or it doesn't apply to them. So I think that's an excellent question, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And in fact, it has come up as a countywide planning discussion, not just a discussion with the United Counties. And that's because we do care about what our neighboring property owners are doing. We do have bylaws in place in North Glengarry as well as South Stormont. They're a little bit more flexible but the other municipalities are in the same position we're in. And we are working together to make sure that we're not going to end up putting each other in a position where people will be forced to go to one municipality and not the other. We do wanna be quite consistent. So again, it's not just the county we're working with, it is all the municipalities in SDNG and keeping an eye on what each other is doing. So yes. Okay, uh, just final subsequent question from me. Uh, being that this is our final uh, extension, are you confident that we'll be able to get this done by uh, by next November? I'm very confident we'll get it done. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there any questions of uh, members of council? Seeing none, moved by Stephanie Jaworski, second by Sam Actonell, be it resolved that staff report 158-2021 be received. And that bylaw 96-2021 being a bylaw to amend bylaw 77-2020, an interim control bylaw to prohibit cannabis cultivation, production and processing throughout the township of South Mangary be read a first, mm -hmm. second and third time passed, signed and sealed in open council this 15th day of November, 2021. All those in favor of the motion. Motion is carried, thank you very much. All right, moving on to staff report 159-2021, Chief Robertson. Good evening and thank you uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. This evening I present to council a health and safety policy we've developed in regards to facial hair. I'll just there, turn the lights on a little bit. Um, the Occupational Health and Safety Act clearly identifies the responsibility of employers, which would be the township, supervisors, which would be South Bungary fire officers, and workers, which would be our firefighters, with respect to the wearing of protective equipment. Some of the main pieces of equipment that we wear in hazardous environments would be our self-contained breathing apparatus or um, our um, respirators. And... Those items assist us in breathing um, where we have contaminated air. So the Canadian Standards Association, as well as all breathing apparatus manufacturers and other national health and safety organizations uh, mandate that wearers of per protect uh, personal protective equipment must be clean shaven to ensure that the respirator has a clean fit and seal. So we've developed uh, health and Safety Policy Fire 01-2021 to ensure that all our firefighters are made aware of and follow the guidelines related to how our personnel address facial hair. We, we've developed this policy for those reasons. Um, I'm presenting it to Council tonight. Um, one, to, to pass this very important policy and also to describe how we intend to move forward with guidelines and policies. So um, this is a very important policy. It, 
it uh, ensures the safety of all of our staff. We, we have numerous guidelines and procedures in the fire service and a, num a few policies. Guidelines and procedures, those are items that uh, can be modified in certain situations. Let's say we have a, a, pol uh, sorry, a guideline that states a certain vehicle needs to only respond with a certain number of uh, people within that vehicle. In certain applications, we may want to modify that guideline and respond with only one or, or added members. That can be done within the terms of a guideline. A policy as signed off and passed by council is very, uh, it, it's not gray in any way. It, it is, this is how the policy is to be followed by staff. This item, this uh, policy that we're bringing forward with facial hair, because of the health and safety requirements, this is an item that needs to be in a policy as opposed to a guideline. And that's the reason why it's brought before you this evening. So um, any questions on the policy or how we uh, bring guidelines and policies forward? Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Chief Robertson. Uh, I just have a question before I go to you, Councillor Dworsky. Um, I'm actually surprised that there isn't something already on the books. Um, my father used to volunteer in Glen Walter uh, a couple decades ago, and there was a big uproar then because uh, a couple of the volunteers had to shave their beards or they were going to be kicked off uh, the department. And, and, and I remember one of them did leave uh, for, for the obvious reason. Uh, so I'm just kind of surprised that we don't have anything on the, the books th thus far. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, we actually do. And more or less what we're doing is we're going through all of our procedures, guidelines and policies and updating them. We have a lot of these policies and procedures that have um, various places in, in history that we've had them uh, enabled and acted. We're just making sure that we're updating them and bringing them all forward into a revised and updated version. So I'm going to be bringing a lot of these to council as we move forward on a regular basis, or at least updating guidelines internally. We're just making sure that everyone is aware of, of these policies as we move forward. So. so is it fair to say this is a product of having a deputy chief that you're able to go through all the, the older uh, policies and bring them up to date? Very much so, and, and I would add uh, our deputy chief, but I would also add our station captains. Our sort of our fire senior management team were we're beginning to evaluate these on an ongoing basis. So, facial Perfect. hair is is, uh, is very fashionable at the moment. I can uh, look on the screen at Councillor McDonnell and yourself, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and uh, and it's no different within the fire service. Uh, it, it's it's uh, something that a number of members are interested in doing, but. The restrictions of the fire service and the expectations of our uh, community, uh, both on the safety and our responsibility uh, abilities, ma mandate that uh, facial hair is not something that we can allow. Okay, for. thank you. Uh, I won't hold you up any further, Councillor Jaworski. Uh, thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor Warden. Um, so, like where I work, like in the refinery context, I mean, it, that this is very standard uh, policy. So, I guess, um, but could you just speak to? I'm assuming that this is standard stuff when it comes to fire service, where you might be using um, assisted breathing apparatus. But if you could just speak to that, please. Yes, this is across the board. This is uh, in Ontario through our fire service section 21 guidance um, notes, which would be a health and safety uh, document that we follow. Um, all fire services are mandated to have this uh, type of policy um, uh, or, or at least operate within. And, and we've decided to ensure that it's through a policy. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, moved by Sam McDonnell, second by Martin Lang. Be resolved that Staff Report 159-2021 be received and that the Council of the Township of South Mungary adopt Fire Policy 01-2021, being a policy to regulate expected personal appearance as it relates to facial hair for members of the South Mungary Fire Service. All those in favor of the motion? 
Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Moving on to staff report one uh, one sixty dash twenty twenty one, Mr. McDonald. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor, and through you, uh, this is um, about cooperative purchasing, and it is a group through LAS, which is the uh, local authority solutions, and a member uh, or um, a subsidiary of AMO. So uh, you're, I think we're all familiar with them. So they recently changed their name to Canoe Procurement Group, and uh, what they do is they do the RFPs and um, find the best price list. This doesn't mean that we can't ask for others, but it certainly saves us considerable administration time because if somebody's already done it and found the best price for our area, in particular for um, I, I'm, this one for the, the arena, there's only so many providers of glycol. Uh, we're likely not gonna find a, a local one that's better. If we do, obviously we'll include them, but it allows us to uh, shortcut the procurement uh, while also remaining uh, competitive in that they've done the work. So uh, we're asking for permission to do this. I think we only have to do it once every council term uh, per section five, 5.4 specifically in, in our purchasing pilot under cooperative purchasing. Um, I don't believe we've done it uh, before. I don't know if we had done it in previous councils, but this might be something we look at at the start of every term of council because it is a great time saver. And if we can save money and time, uh, that's, that's a human resources win as well as a financial win. So again, looking specifically, I believe for the, uh, glycol lines and dasher boards they're somewhat um, they're somewhat select and I, I know we can just reach out to their qualified buyers and ask for their prices and uh, proceed from there so what we're asking is permission to do that and then we will post accordingly as you can see on point number six page 43 uh, we'll, we'll put that on our bid and go or uh, um, there's another one I don't know if we use bid and go presently but it, it, like an online site we'll also post on our website uh, if approved tonight so I'll leave it for any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. McDonald. I think this is uh, great. I think any time when you buy in bulk, you, you're able to save most times, not necessarily in all times, but uh, I really like to, I like to see this. Uh, and I'd like it not just to be limited to just the, what, what you have here. Uh, you know, if there's ways to get our fuel cheaper or any other commodities that we need, uh, and this seems to be a good avenue, I hope staff will uh, continue to explore that. Oh, we certainly will. And we also, and sorry, just to jump in, we you can buy tires. There's all sorts of, there's all sorts of things for the fleet, et cetera. So, so we will look at into this uh, when we can. Great, thank you very much. Councillor uh, Lane. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not against doing this. I, I just wanna make sure that the, the bids are going out, that local people are able to uh, to uh, to bid and it doesn't uh, hinder uh, you know just make it, I don't want just to save a bit of work and then it, it cuts out our local our local bidders if this is you know coming in at uh, as a province wide thing and you know I'm assuming the big guys in, in Toronto and stuff will be signed on here where local people may not have signed on to this sort I want to make sure that they're included and they have a chance to bid on things. Very good points, Councillor Lang. Are there any other comments? Seeing none, moved by Martin Lang, second by Stephanie Jaworski, be it resolved that staff report 160-2021 be received and that the Council of the Township of South Lingary approves administration to proceed with utilizing canoe for cooperative purchasing and that the deputy mayor and clerk may approve and authorize any related documentation. All those in favor of the motion? Motion is carried, thank you very much. Okay, just give me a couple of seconds, please. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Staff report 161 2021, Mr. LeBlanc. I believe, Deputy Mayor, that I'm presenting this tonight. Oh, okay. That's all right. Yep. Ms. McDonald. Excellent, thank you. And through you, Deputy Mayor Warden, the purpose of the staff report is to request that council approve uh, administration's recommendation for a supplier of speed radar signs. So as you know, an RFQ went out in mid-September and closed in mid-October and we read four speed radar signs and we received five submissions. And it is our recommendation that we proceed awarding a contract to Traffic Logic who had the low bid 
of $2,937 and that their high price for the second unit was $4,067. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. McDonald, is this a unit price or is this for a specific amount of signs? Each price is a unit price for supply and install. Okay, and these are fixed signs or mobile signs? Because I, I don't find the current signs that we have had are, uh, have been working out well. These are for mobile signs and they come with either a mounting bracket that can wrap around a post or a mounting bracket that can sit on top of a post. If that makes sense. So we can either sit it on top or, or wrap around. Okay, okay, that's good. Uh, all right, any other questions of uh, members of council? Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor Thru. Thank you for the presentation, uh, Ms. McDonald. Can you, what's the difference between, what's the low price and high price? Is this a range that they're giving or these are for two different uh, units? Two different units. So we requested the Safe Pace Evolution 15. And if council will indulge me with my old school technology, it looks like this. Okay. Um, and the Safe Pace 450 or 550 looks, looks something like this. Okay. Uh, so they're different units. They have different uh, different number of display lights, I suppose, and, and kind of diff different features. And we can use them in different locations depending on, on what our aim is. So in a school zone, for example, we may want to have a bit more ability to say more or um, out in a rural location, uh, a less expensive sign. Are you thinking of uh, two apiece or what are your thoughts? We hadn't considered how many we may need. Um, if Mr. LeBlanc is on the line, I believe he may be able to confirm that our current inventory has, has been depleted. So at a minimum, we'd be looking to replenish what we had before, which I believe is two units. If I may, yes, uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, I do believe we had budgeted some funds to buy more than just two units. So hopefully uh, there is funds in the budget uh, and that we can get these uh, signs out there as soon as possible. Council has certainly expressed uh, a desire uh, for these signs. So hopefully uh, it certainly is more than two. Uh, okay, any other questions or comments? Councillor Jaworski. Thank you through you, Deputy Mayor Warden. Just quickly, I just wanted to say that I, I really like these signs. And to your point, I think we should have more than, than, than less. They seem to be a fair, very effective. The literature I've read about them is like their psychological impact is, is good in that the sense that people actually do really slow down when they see them. And I really like having that option of the one that has the little message because I've seen, you know, I've seen those in action and uh, they do have a, an extra punch, I guess, and how they deliver the message in certain areas, I think that's really warranted. So it's good to see we have the option of both. Thank you for those comments. Um, CAO Mills. Thank you through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. In the past, you know, we've, we've uh, had a draft com uh, traffic calming policy. We brought it to council a few times. We had agreed that we were going to wait until Ms. McDonald came on staff and we're going to continue to review that we have had a number of constituents put in their concerns and or complaints uh, through the complaints process about speed. And we have identified, I would say certainly three school areas where there are county roads, where the speed is high going, going uh, in both directions, especially in one direction, but in, in the case of Williamstown, for example, in both directions. So this is a start, it replaces what we have, but the intention of the traffic calming, the draft traffic calming policy and what's been coming forward in the two years I've been here is that we're gonna put a strategy forward to involve the community in consultation. And uh, then we would uh, be able to, uh, through, through budget process, add signs as we go that um, we're, this is a start, it's just a start. Step in the right direction. Thank you. Seeing no other hands up, moved by Stephanie Jaworski, second by Sam McDonnell. Be it resolved that Staff Report 161-2021 be received and that the Council of the Township of South Glengarry award RFQ 21-2021 for the purchase of traffic calming measures to traffic 
logics as per their submission of $29.37 to $4,067. And furthermore, the deputy mayor and clerk be authorized to sign any relevant documents. All those in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to staff report 162 2021. Ms. McDonald. Thank you. And through you, Deputy Mayor Warden, the purpose of this staff report is to request the Council approve administration's recommendation for the award of the Municipal Engineering Services RFP that was um, put out in mid September and closed on October 13th. Um, the RFP was to obtain quotes from engineering consulting firms to have on a roster essentially on an ad, as needed basis over a two year term or over a three year term, sorry, with an option for a two year extension to either represent the township if we need them, uh, advise the township on matters, provide peer, peer reviews, or perhaps complete design assignments. So any, anything that we might need that they may be able to provide. We did receive three submissions. So the three respondents were Ainley Graham and Associates, EVB Engineering, and Morrison Hirschfield. And each respondent was asked to provide a technical proposal, which we reviewed. And all three respondents met the minimum technical requirements. We then proceeded to look at their price submission. And they were asked to provide a weighted hourly rate to provide any range of services. And that hourly rate in the original RFP was requested that they include their disbursements and their travel expenses through an addendum. The township agreed that the weighted rate could not include those items. So we have one respondent whose weighted rate includes, no, does not include travel or disbursements. And the other two respondents bundled their travel and disbursements into the hourly rate. So in point nine in the staff report that explains or that, that can give some context to council for why those three rates are quite, quite different with, with Ainley providing or noting that their travel and disbursements would be outside of that hourly rate. Um, so it is our, our recommendation after speaking with numerous references. So we did reach out to the, um, the references that the engineering consulting firms provided of similar size to the township of South Glengarry. And many of them said that they have found in recent years that it's useful to have more than one firm um, available that you have a relationship with so that when firm A, let's say, is busy, you still have someone to fall back on and rely on. And different firms have different strengths and weaknesses and, and experience. So it is our recommendation that we award this contract to, to all three. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I, think this is, uh, I think this is a good idea. Um, it's not normal that we award to three of the tender, uh, uh, you know, companies that bid, but I like the idea of having all three on our side and, and we kind of have a parameter of what the charges will be. Uh, and, and I know that, uh, you know, traveling expenses, there's, there's certain caps to that. So, so we can, we could see or imagine that all three are going to be fairly Close in line. Any other comments? Seeing none, moved by Sam Actonell, second by Martin Lang, be resolved that staff report 162 2021 be received, and that RFP 18 2021 for the professional municipal engineering services be awarded on an as needed basis for roster assignments to Ainley Graham and Associates Limited, EVB Engineering and Morrison Hirschfeld Limited following their weighted hourly rate submissions at their proposed annual rate increase. All those in favor of the motion. Motion is carried, thank you very much. And moving on to item 7D. Um, <laughs> Uh, 7DG, I believe. Oh, I skipped ahead on Miss Haley. I apologize. 7B, floodplain mapping project update. My apologies, Miss uh, Haley. No problem. 
So thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, Mr. McDonald and I would like to provide council an update and, and thank you for allowing us to put this um, in this section of the agenda so we could speak to it. Uh, you may recall that we applied for funding in September of 2017 to obtain uh, dollars to create new floodplain mapping along the St. Lawrence and the Raisin River systems. And this was through a program called the National Disaster Mitigation Program. The purpose of this program is to allow us to be more informed from an emergency planning perspective, um, to educate our residents in terms of where our flood zones will be. And it also allows us to have more accurate floodplain mapping from, for land use planning projects as well. Um, the project received, or the township received $116,000 in funding, which was the full request, as the total project estimate was $249,250. And um, but basically we were allowed to get up to four or 50% of funding and we received 49% of funding. We were fortunate throughout the project that prices came in much less expensive than we had anticipated. With uh, the company we used to obtain the LIDAR imaging, uh, they were doing work in our area because they believe they're from Calgary or, or Alberta anyway. They were doing work in our area that really saved um, some time and money that ended up with a much lesser expense than we anticipated. The engineering came in around uh, the cost that we did anticipate. And then both township staff and, and the RCA staff provided more in-kind work. And we had less incidental expenses like current costs and printing costs and things like that. So you'll see in the uh, report that we've provided to you that um, the total project cost was $177,000 or excuse me, yes, the total project cost was $177,426, which was $71,000 under budget. Always nice to be under budget, but keep in mind that because we were under budget, we also received a little bit of less money from the province, or excuse me, the federal government, because we were at 49% of the total eligible uh, provincial costs. Still, regardless, it resulted in um, an overall savings of $25,323, and we now own up-to-date floodplain mapping. You might think that this report is a little bit late, but it's actually kind of timely. Uh, Council's been very involved in our official plan appeal, and we know that that appeal process is hopefully coming to an end in early 2022, which will allow us to then move to the next steps. And those next steps would involve uh, presenting these maps to Council, letting you understand uh, the positive and negative impacts to our South Gary residents, and it'll also allow us to plan to do some uh, communication campaigns with the uh, residents as well, so they know what uh, the floodplain potential is in our area. And then from there, once we have council support, we would consider doing an official plan amendment that would then lead to a new zoning bylaw. And when a new official plan is in place, we have five years to bring a zoning bylaw into compliance. And of course, we want to do that as quickly as possible. Did I say five years? So I'm sorry, I think it's three years. And we wanna do that as quickly as possible so we're using the most up-to-date information. In the meantime, when we do have development proposals on the waterfront, we'll take a look at them and it'll give us better advice, both um, staff as well as the RCA staff kind of help us understand if development is, is possible, but these are not being formally used yet until we go through all of those processes that I outlined. So this was just an opportunity to get the final numbers before council. As I knew you were aware of the project being completed, we just hadn't discussed uh, the overall uh, final costs. So thank you for allowing us to do this and we look forward to moving towards the next steps in 2022. Thank you. Okay, thanks again for your presentation, Ms. Haley. I think uh, this, this uh, piece of, um, well, data is so important uh, to the development and uh, future development and uh, current development into our municipality. And I am quite, I'm very much looking forward to it being implemented and implemented into the official plan because it'll allow you and your staff to say, this is the current mapping. Mm -hmm. No, you cannot develop or absolutely here's the parameters. Uh, just being in limbo it must be tough because there's probably some areas where you know that it may be in the floodplain, but the, the old mapping and vice versa. So I think once we get it updated, I think it'll be better 
uh, for most, not all. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, moving on to seven, what did I say? Seven B G. Chief Robertson, I believe you want to bring that forward. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, this evening, I would like to uh, bring forward Council's uh, knowledge and exciting uh, funding opportunity provided to us by Enbridge Gas Incorporated. Um, this year, South Glengarry Fire Service and our municipality have been uh, selected to participate in the 2021 Safe Community Project Zero com campaign, which basically has Enbridge Gas supplying combination 10-year sealed battery smoke and carbon monoxide uh, alarms and detectors to our residents. The aim of the program is to distribute these items to residents who are deemed high risk, that those being those with financial um, struggles or those elderly or with um, restricted means. So Enbridge Gas has uh, donated 168 combination alarms to South Glengarry with a total value, retail value of $10,000. Um, it, it's excellent that this is, we are able to participate in this. Some of the members of our community will be um, afforded a, an excellent opportunity here. So we are currently developing the, our means of outreach and um, dispersal for these items into our community. And um, I just wanted to share that, inf that uh, great information so, and the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, this is not the first time that Enbridge has uh, awarded our municipality since I've been on council. I, I would say this is at a minimum the second time, maybe, maybe, maybe more. Uh, thank you. You're, you're very correct. This is the first time in this specific program, but they have, uh, as recently as last year, so, um, this would be probably the fourth time, I think, but last year's event, they had provided us uh, money for um, certain uh, equipment that we utilize that uh, sort of, they like some of their programs to reference around the supply of the um, services that they provide, which would be natural gas. So for training, thank you. Which makes total sense. Thank you very much for bringing that forward. It's always nice when we have uh, uh, are able to partner with some corporate uh, corporate folks. Moving on, are there any other questions? I apologize of uh, members of council on that. Seeing none, moving on to 7DH. Uh, the summary uh, Redwood uh, Kennedy Redwood survey. Uh, did who requested that to be for, brought forward? I, it was one that I wanted to speak to as well. Councillor Jaworski. Yeah, and I think Councillor McDonnell also wants to bring it forward. Okay, uh, Mr. McDonald, did you want to speak to it? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And through you, um, the report is kind of two pages, so it looks a little small, but it is the kind of culmination of our of our works that we've been doing over the past, I'd say, few years. Um, after this, uh, we have Lancaster uh, will be decreasing considerably. Glen Walter will be uh, maintaining and, and then Green Valley will be maintaining and then 3% per year. This was the last one that uh, required a little bit more tweaking. So we had started out uh, with a 10% increase suggested. That wasn't very well received. And then uh, we went, surveyed the group as you, as you can see through there, 24 supported it, five did not support it. I would imagine that the five that did not support it were owners of those develop, uh, undeveloped lots. And then on the second page, so 89 of your agenda, I would like to, if you can see, um, oh, maybe I'll just see if I can put it on so everybody can see what I'm talking about, even our online folks. Yes, so, that would be wonderful. So I believe you can see, is it um, zoomed in enough? Uh, more, please. Okay. Better? Uh, mm -hmm. Go one more. You were you were close. Okay. Here there, we go. Thank you. So if you look, uh, I believe you can see my mouse too. So the dollar amounts, that's the constructed rate and the vacant rate is here. Our current situation uh, would bring in $35,640. And if we maintain that, uh, there's the constructed rate and there's the vacant rate. This isn't 
perfect. Somebody noted that I still have the construct vacant rate here, but if you look on 2022, and we're not, we're, we kind of discounted the 10% for four years, 3% afterwards. So we're looking really at options three and four. Uh, and we had proposed to them uh, through administration that obviously 2021 is already billed. It's billed with the tax bills, but in 2022, with 29 lots increasing by 3.75% at their current rates, we'd collect that much money. And then if we turned the non-constructed lots, the vacant rate, change that to be the same, it would garner us $10,000. So we'd see $43,000 in revenue. Um, there was a citizen who lamented that 3.75 was a little too much, uh, but 3% is what they, uh, they thought. So it is quite close. I look more towards this number at the end in 2026, because if you look at the 10% one, the idea was to get there and, and then apply subsequent 3% increases. Um, this is kind of a middle ground. It's not a lot difference uh, between these two, $1,800 amongst 38 lots. Um, and that's after five years of implementation. I, I do think a little bit more would be nice. Uh, obviously um, 53,000 is what uh, EBB recommended, but we thought we could go down a little bit more and then the vacant, uh, changing the vacant lots to constructed rate was brought forward. So that is a, an interesting take to it. So um, I'm suggesting the 3.75 for four years, keeping in mind that uh, we'd originally proposed 10% for four and then three years and then 7% for four and three years. And then that vacant uh, lot came up. So uh, I think this is a happy medium and I, I hope they would be somewhat satisfied. I know, um, I know they have a, a, a very um, active community that, that consults amongst each other. Um, but this is uh, much better than where we began. And I, I think uh, while maintaining uh, some money for the infrastructure, which would be great. Okay, uh, if you could, exit, thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm gonna open it up uh, to the floor for discussion. I'll start with you, Councillor Jaworski. Thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor Warden. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our, our GM of Finance for continuing to work on this water file. I know that it's, uh, it's been a long uh, go and we've, we've sent him back several times to do more ding digging and looking at more scenarios. So I appreciate that. I recognize that this is the last, the last lap. So uh, I appreciate And so I also wanted to say that I really appreciate you doing the survey with the residents of Kennedy Redwood. They, I, I feel that they were sort of left out in the original work and you know when it came to the end uh sort of the really high rate that the increase that was being proposed um i think was coming out of a shock coming out of shock and i think it really made sense that we take a long look at it and see if we can't sharpen our pencils and uh, also the fact that you did the survey and that through that survey interesting information came out the issue of the the vacant lots i certainly learned a lot through that process i wasn't aware of how many vacant lots there were and also the history of that subdivision and how you know basically there could not have been a subdivision there without the water plant and the water plant is sized based on the number of lots that are, are, are that were built and so it's a it's a unique scenario i guess it's a small subdivision with a water plant and it's there's no uh, metering everyone pays a set everyone who's connected pays a set rate so it's a it's i'm not going to say it's a simple situation but I think I think what you're proposing I think makes sense in a lot of ways. Um, certainly, it's much the much lower increase for the average users, um, and it also uh, helps get to that point of reserves that was deemed to be the right level, so that we can't so that that pumping station, et cetera, can be properly maintained. And um, although it's unusual, I guess I guess it's unusual to um, to have a connection, uh, to have a, a fee for vacant lots. Again, this is a unique scenario in that it's that plant was sized on each of these lots having having been connected to water. And so, I guess in some respect, all the folks who are already connected are sort of subsidizing these vacant lots, sort of uh, not being developed. And that's sort of the purpose of the subdivision is that each of these lots has the same motivation to be developed. So, I, I think. Your uh, that scenario you're suggesting recommending makes sense, but I'd like to hear what uh, the rest of the council has to say as well. Thank you very much, Councillor Jaworski. Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Through you, thank you, Mr. McDonald, for the presentation. I agree. I'm okay with uh, with the third proposal there at 3.7 percent. 
I know the people with vacant lots won't be that happy, but I, I think that uh, some of these vacant lots are people who are looking for a larger lot and have bought the lot beside them and uh, do not want to develop. And I don't think it's fair for the rest of the residents to have to subsidize those people to have bigger lots, you know, because as you said, uh, the plant was designed for, for the, the number of lots that were created. So we have to find a way to be able to make this plan go forward. And uh, we can't just keep uh, going in deficit here. We need to get the money in place to be able to replace equipment as is needed. So I'm in favor. Thank you, Councillor McDonnell. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll uh, I'll agree with my two council colleagues. Uh, I agree he's going that route. Uh, I agree with Councillor Lang in particular on, on that comment as, as far as uh, the water system was built to, to house a certain amount of lots. There is no real uh, space for expansion on that water plant as far as servicing other lots in the area. And there is no, uh, no real point in going that route as it is. Unfortunately, smaller water systems cost more to run. It's, uh, it's a luxury as well as a curse at the same time for, but uh, the residents knew they were at when they purchased those homes. But uh, no, I agree. I think the, the uh, undeveloped lots will have to pay more. And I'd like to thank the GM uh, for also spending some time with Councillor Jaworski and I a few months ago on this and, and giving us some added information. And I appreciate the report tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's nothing more I can say. I agree. Uh, so, uh, Mr. McDonald, you have your direction from Council. Uh, and if it needs to go into a formal resolution, please coordinate that with uh, the clerk, Ms. Campo, and we will uh, get it done sooner than later. Uh, if, if it needs to be done by resolution, uh, if you could prepare that for the next meeting, and then that way, that way there, and also a letter should be sent out to the residents. Uh, so that they know what's coming uh, on next year's tax bill. Okay, thank you. So I believe that was it for uh, pulled business uh, on the agenda. Moved by Martin Lang, second by Stephanie Jaworski, be it resolved that the Council of the Township of South Mangary accepts the items presented on the agenda as committee reports and for information purposes only. All those in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. I lost my spot here. So one second, my apologies. Where did the darn thing go? There we go. So I guess that's heading into, should have just moved up my resolution. So moved by Stephanie Jaworski, second by Sam McDonnell, be it resolved that the council convene to close session at 8 12 p.m. to discuss the following items under section 239 of the municipal act 2001 to a meeting or part of a meeting may be closed to the public if the subject matter discussed is c acquisition or disposition of land specifically land acquisition and e litigate uh, litigation or potential litigation specifically ongoing little litigation update all those in favor of the motion motion is carried thank you I'd like to thank the public for attending this evening's uh first portion of the meeting and we will uh be back live to close the meeting once this closed session 